You are listening to Our Urban Voices with Dr. Alphonse Javet, a podcast that presents Christian narratives through diverse voices that impact urban ministry. Here is your host. In this podcast, we cover everything from churches and church planting efforts, mission and missions organization evangelism, and unreached people groups, emerging movements and initiatives, justice, current events related to faith, and the persecuted church to author interviews, and more. Let's get to it. Welcome back to Our Urban Voices. I'm your host, Dr. Alphonse Javed. I'm joined by Dr. Alnard Franklin. Bomb. Now, if I pronounce that incorrect, he's going to correct me later. I know that I did. He is the founder of Ariel Ministries, which focuses on Bible teaching from Messianic Jewish perspective. Our topic will focus on the importance of Israelology in understanding Jesus's earthly ministry and his return. Our guest today, the, he has his PhD from New York University, and he is the founder and director of Ariel Ministries. For more than 45 years, he has focused on evangelizing Jewish people and discipling believers through personal witness and authoring 30 plus books. And uh, the book we're going to focus on or talk about is Israelology, the missing link in systematic theology. So thank you so much for joining us. First of all, please let the audience know your last name. Okay. That means, means fruitful tree. All right. So before we get to our topic, please tell me a little bit about your family uh, background. So go ahead, share a little bit about your family, please. It's small. I, I have only one wife and no children. So the family is she and I. We have more distant families, cousins and so on. But as far as you meet family, it's just the two of us. That's awesome. So uh, would you briefly explain for our listeners what Israelology is? Because everybody knows what theology is. What is Israelology? And why it's important in understanding Jesus's earthly ministry? Basically, I was sitting in a class in uh, systematic theology at seminary, and they were dealing with ecclesiology. And my, the thought came into my mind, if there's an ecclesiology, why is there no Israelology? Now, in systems that teach replacement theology, that's logical. They would not have an Israelology. But the school I went to was dispensational, that's Dallas Seminary. And they did cover things about Israel, dealing with Israel past, Israel future, not so much about Israel present. But it was not systematized into one unit within systematic theology. And what we mean by systematic theology is that the Bible doesn't teach everything about God and God's ministry, God's work, all in one place. You wouldn't have a study on what's the Bible teach about the Holy Spirit. It begins in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, the Spirit brooded upon the face of the waters, and it ends again in Revelation 22. And between those two chapters, first and last of the scriptures, there's all kinds of things about the Holy Spirit, both in the Hebrew Bible and the Greek New Testament. So you want to teach something about a subject, you have to look at all the verses and look at all the context and then organize it. And so ecclesiology is all that the Bible teaches about the church. And Israelology would then be all the Bible teaches about Israel theologically, not necessarily historically, but theologically. And so when I went to New York University for my doctorate, I used that title as for my doctorate dissertation. And that's what Israelology is. Everything the Bible teaches about Israel theologically, past, and present and future and other areas that are not limited to those three time zones. That's awesome. So if we consider Jesus's earthly ministry, what do we think is something important that we miss when we look at it from a modern American perspective instead of the context in which he lived, which is historic Israel, but also theological understanding of Israel and all that, what you just mentioned. In the three different uh, Christian schools I attended, whenever they dealt with the historical backgrounds to the Gospels, they always focused on the Greek 
aroma backgrounds, which is uh, very helpful for certain segments of the New Testament, such as Corinthians and Galatians, Ephesians, and so on. What people miss is that the life of the Messiah did not play out within the framework of a Greek or Roman culture, but a Jewish culture, and a very specific Jewish culture, that of first century Israel. And so to the Gospels, all four of them, things are said the way they are said, things happen the way they happen, certain teachings follow one another based upon a specific Jewish frame of reference of that day. And that's very seldom taught in the church. In all the Christian schools, there's only two schools I know of that have a Jewish studies major, and that is Moody Bible Institute, and then um, and Tyndale Bible College and Seminary, but otherwise, except for those two exceptions, it does not exist in Christian colleges or Christian seminaries. And so part of the purpose of what we do, organizing teaching sessions on what Israelology is, and we have a summer program that runs for eight weeks from the first Saturday of July until the Labor Day weekend. It's a five-year summer program, so people have to come for five summers to get everything we offer. But that's where we teach the whole run of uh, mostly the life of Messiah from that same Messianic Jewish perspective of the first century Israel. So, so I like that what you just said, that you are working with even seminaries and colleges too. And uh, the idea is, yes, uh, Greek context is good because uh, you know it was that too but most importantly when it comes to Jesus and gospels you have to have the first century Jewish uh, context so um, let me ask you about the discipleship in that context would you comment uh, on the example that Jesus gave us for discipleship in the modern American church how do you think it differs in practice with from from uh, his example of uh, discipleship I'm asked about the purpose of REL Ministries. Uh, we have a twofold purpose. First of all, to evangelize, share the gospel with our Jewish people. This will be done, of course, among unbelievers. But then secondly, to disciple both Jewish and Gentile believers from this Messianic Jewish perspective. And so following um, Yeshua, following Jesus' principle, he ministered to the people of Israel as a whole, at least until Matthew chapters 12 and 13. But he also focused on 12 men he chose to be discipled. And he had 70 disciples which were on call, but the 12 were to be with him all of the time. And in that three-year period that he spent with them, he discipled them very well. They didn't understand as yet the program of death and resurrection, nor did they understand the program of two separate comings of the Messiah. But they understood many other things, and what they did not understand, they received in that 40-day period between the resurrection of the Messiah and the ascension of the Messiah. So when the time he ascended and the Holy Spirit came 10 days later, that's when these men were now fully prepared to go out in the streets and proclaim the gospel and in a, sense, in a way that Jewish people could understand and did understand, and so many, many came to faith as a result. So I would apply to an American church. The pastor needs to minister to the church as a whole, but at the same time, he should pick out a small group of men that show special interest in the details of scripture and spend more time with them. Did the discipleship classes with groups of men for a two year period that we would meet three times a week. And then when that finished, we would have a second class and so on. But focus especially on teaching the deep meat of the word of God among the few who are willing to learn. And then um, they the ones to be able to go out either in full-time ministry or not in full-time ministry, but still be actively involved in teaching and things of that nature. And so pastor must do two things. Minister to the congregation as a whole, but focus more on those who are real students of the word and disciple them so they too can disciple others as well. I'm trying to understand, um, um, or not understand, I think I'm trying to connect your advice to my church. So if I am, uh, yes, I, I, I can, which I do. I mean, I have uh, two, three men that I'm already investing in, in them, and I want to continue to do that. But to me, extension of that pastoral work is the elders, elders being pastors, pastors being elder. 
That's how my mind works. So all of us are engaged in that activity. So in light of Jesus' example of leadership and discipleship, um, what do you think are some of the implications for individual Christians or leaders in today's church? Um, both. We're talking about now discipleship and leadership. What are, the, what are your thoughts on that? Well, many churches uh, just have their Sunday services and maybe a Wednesday prayer meeting plus the totality of their outreach. Okay. And that's not going to work. Okay. Uh, what you need is uh, more intensive teaching. Now, many of the churches that I know of also have small Bible study groups uh, for mm -hmm. different parts of the city or whatever. But the question is, uh, how organized is it? Sometimes they're mostly a time of uh, a fellowship and just answer a few lighthearted questions and things of that nature, but they're not being in they're not being trained in understanding what the text says, what the context says of that nature. So that's not helpful either. So what these small uh, study groups that have to need to be done is to cl clearly understand what it means to convey the word of God, the content of the word of God. The discipleship classes I had we would meet three times a week. One time a week was to go through a book of the Bible. That would include a historical book, a poetic book, a prophetic book, and so on from both Testaments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then the second time uh, would be a topical study, and we go through the whole systematic theology in the topical study. But then the third session each week, we would, um, for 10 sessions of, the, of that third type of study, we teach the principles of interpretation, but then we pick a book and we have uh, each week a different member of the group teach a chapter, so like Galatians 1, next, chapter, wow. next uh, week Galatians 2, and he's then critiqued by his fellow students. I would meet him on the side and have a private conversation afterwards, but, um, but he meets with the, um, uh, he is confronted, not confronted, but critiqued or supported by other students in that same class. And um, I had more time, I was able to do this in one year, but then we had to expand it to two years. But that's the way we were able to raise people who will take leadership roles in the wow. their own congregation that they go to and so on. Hmm. And that's what it was our intended to do. And so that worked, that worked very well. So the setting you are giving me, that could be a um, organized uh, uh, Bible institution or Bible classes, right? But do you think that's possible in a local church setting where we have small groups? Can we do that there too? I definitely can do it if uh, the people involved understand what they need to convey and accomplish. Right. And so you don't just um, choose elders to be elders who are not that well knowledgeable and then they become leaders. Well, that's not going to... Uh, that's not going to progress and get done. What you need is to train people to be biblical elders right. and then, and so on, and then let them take positions and they need to understand that they have to study the text before they teach it. Right, right. When they teach it, they have to convey to the people how they are themselves to learn how to do these things. Not only learn and teach, uh, would you also agree that it needs to have the application as well, right? They, they've got to live out that too. From, from context in which Jesus is leading and training people, do you think there's room for that application or we just should stick with the text and just, okay, we just need to train people in the interpretation of the text so they understand what it means and all that? Or you think it's got to have the balance of application too? To the larger audience, like the Sunday morning services, then that's where the applications would fit. But when you're doing discipleship leading for people in leadership role, I don't worry about the application. Mm -hmm. If there's a natural application, I will definitely bring it out. But I find people sometimes struggle to just because they feel they have to have an application, they pull out an application that really is not that relevant to the text that they were just teaching. Mm -hmm and so on. So I think that uh, in discipleship, I don't worry about the application. If it comes naturally, I will teach it. But if it doesn't come naturally, I won't teach it. The more important, important to me is to convey the content of the text, whatever the text may be, to the audience I'm discipling. Now, in a five-year program up in upstate New York, mm -hmm. uh, you have to come for five summers to get everything we offer. But within those eight weeks, we have a two-week program curriculum 
followed by a three week curriculum, followed by one week and followed by two week, and then the Labor Day weekend for more of the easier way to relax, but also teach. Mm -hmm. But the one course we teach every year because of it's important is in the sixth week. It's a 25 hour course in the life of the Messiah from a Messianic Jewish perspective. And um, we teach three hours in the morning and two hours in the evening. So in one week, we can get the whole 25 hour subject done. That's because of its importance, knowing the Jewish background, that's the one course we teach every year. All other courses are in a five year cycle and, and it's open anybody that wants to learn, but they need to know they're coming as students, not just um, enjoy the mountains. But um, they'll enjoy the time as well. We have song, we have dance, messianic dance, and things of that mm -hmm. nature. But they all come now and knowing that we are serious and getting the content of the Bible and the enjoyment. And we love enjoyment, but that's always secondary to learning the scriptures in that period of time. That's awesome. So let's switch the conversation a little bit. Uh, um, why do you think? Israelogy is important to understand the end time and Jesus' return. Well, Israelogy is important to know everything the Bible teaches about Israel. So if you deal with Israel past, then you're dealing with the various covenants God made with Israel, both conditional like the Mosaic and the unconditional like the Abrahamic, the land, the Davidic and new covenants. It also clearly defines the distinction between Israel and the church. In the area of Israel present, and that's an area that even dispensational theology has largely ignored, but that's where we bring, bring up the issues and how does God's program of Israel work out in this present age and so on. And it's important to understand. And what you learn from the present is that the Bible makes a clear distinction between Israel and the church. This will appear 73 times exactly in the New Testament. Not once is it used of the church. It's either used of the Jewish people in general, and also, and also sometimes just of the Messianic Jewish community, the remnant of Israel. It's never used of Gentile believers, never used of the church. And that distinction needs to be maintained. And that's what Israel present will show during going to Israel future. Then you understand God's program for the church that involves the rapture, but God's program for Israel involves the second coming. And while there are no prerequisites for the rapture, it could happen any moment of time, is part of God's program for the church. For Israel, the second coming is God's program for Israel, and there's one key precondition, and that is Israel's national salvation. And so Satan, knowing that that's the prerequisite, he's always had a war against the Jews. Mm. And in the tribulation, he will target the Jews with total destruction to avoid Israel's national salvation, because if that happens, that fulfills the prerequisite to the second coming. So all of these are uniquely relevant to the whole study of Israelology. Well, well there, I also want to just raise it very quickly, um, a question that is, uh, and again, our listeners are... Um, uh, might be, um, uh, you know, pre-trib, tribulation, might be mid-trib. So um, I, I don't want to go there, but I do need to ask one sp specific question. There are two uh, appearances, right? One is the rapture one. I, I, I'm with you on that one too. But the second one, in the second coming, the second one, do you think that has focus on the Jewish people? Because the state of Israel will be, um, under attack. Well, how do you see that? What happens beginning with the abomination of desolation, which happens at the midpoint of the tribulation, when the Antichrist takes over the Jewish temple, sees himself in it, proclaims himself to be God Almighty, calls upon the whole world to worship him as God, and to signify their acceptance of his deity by taking the mark of 666. But that's going to be an opportunity given only to the Gentile world. For the Jews, there's no such opportunity, and Jews will be targeted for total destruction. And according to Zechariah chapter 13, verses 8 and 9, the massive persecution of the Jews will begin with the abomination at the midpoint of the tribulation. And it's going to, for the next three and a half years, there'll be a Nazi like program to annihilate all the Jews. And according to Zechariah, two thirds are going to be destroyed. However, one third survives, 
and this one third will finally come to a national salvation. And once they come to national salvation at the end of uh, Zechariah 13, then the beginning of Zechariah 14, guess what happens? The second coming of the Messiah. And uh, so that is the prerequisite. Keep in mind, Messiah left the earth because of Israel's rejection. He will not come back to the earth until Israel accepts him. Yeah. That is the key precondition. And that's your, your uh, foundational theological basis for anti-Semitism to avoid the first coming before he came and now to avoid the second coming. Right. So again, I'm putting bringing that back. So that means rapture is, of course, rapture is for the believers. But then the focus, but the, the following focuses on Israel so that Israel as a nation, whether it's a small portion left after that annihilation, still they as a nation come to the Lord. Then the Lord comes, right? But when he comes, that means the prerequisite has met. But the Lord coming is not for the salvation of Israel, but now it's for the salvation of, fill in the blanks, please. Israel is saved as the nation before he comes. That has to happen before he comes. And when he comes, the armies of the world are gathered against the Jewish people to try to annihilate the one-third remnant still living. That's when he enters into conflict between the all the armies of the Antichrist, which mm -hmm. includes all the armies of the world. And, and he will begin to slowly annihilate that whole army and finally uh, may take a victory ascent up upon the Mount of Alice. Right. So Armageddon begins before the second coming. During Armageddon, there's a national salvation of Israel, and then following national salvation, there will come the second coming. And that will lead to a 75-day interval before the establishment of the Messianic kingdom. Yeah. Amen. Uh, that's why I wanted to just uh, kind of like uh, direct our conversation toward that point that Israel is the focus there. Um, so let, let's, there's another question that many people, um, have in their minds and, um, I've been asked, so I'm going to ask you this question too. When you look at the, at current events and the war in Ukraine, do you think they relate to the, to end time prophecy? Why or why not? One thing I have to keep emphasizing is for people not to practice what I call newspaper exegesis. Right. Okay. Some world event occurs and they try to find a verse here or a verse there that would be similar and therefore say it is now being fulfilled. A prophecy is never fulfilled approximately. It's always fulfilled precisely. And the Gog and Magog war they keep asking me about has nothing to do with the Ukraine. Russia is attacking to the West, but in the Gog and Magog passage of Ezekiel 38 and 39, Russia is moving to the South against the people of Israel. And so it is a, it is a, an important um, historical event and also a key event uh, for political reasons, but that's all it is. And, and what's happening to Ukraine is small to what happened under Nazi Germany. Look how many countries they very quickly defeated yeah. So far, um, Russia has not defeated the Ukraine. Whether they will or will not, it does not fulfill any prophecy because there's no any prophecy about a war between Russia and the Ukraine. And so it's significant otherwise, but it's not biblically or prophetically significant. Yeah. So there are so many conspiracies theory, conspiracy theories about the end time and speculations about prophecies frequently by false prophets. How can Christian approach discussions about the end time in a beneficial manner? First of all, when they're confronted by these various theories, the question is, what uh, the very Jewish question is, where is it written? If you say this is a fulfillment of prophecy, where is the prophecy written? Now give your verse, then turn the Bible to that verse, and then look at the context. The most Bibles today give you a, when new paragraphs begin. So begin with the paragraph and read the whole paragraph and see if what they're saying theoretically fits. And of course, it will not fit. And so that's the, that's the problem with newspaper exegesis. It's that kind of stuff that's given prophecy a bad name and also give those kind of things. But we have to stay with the text of scripture. 
when I was disciple, I was I learned this. I expound the word, the, the biblical passage for all its worth. But once the passage stops, then just stop. No speculation, no theories, no nothing. This is where the text stops, and that's where we need to stop, and we'll see what God does thereafter. So that would be how they should approach. A text stops, we should stop. But the last part of this question is, is it beneficial? Discussion about the end times. Uh, it's beneficial if they're focused on the word as it is written and not based upon the latest news items. That's fair. the issue. Fair, fair statement. So, Arnold, if listeners want to get in touch with you or find your books, um, what are the easiest ways? But if they want to go by computer, they can go to ariel.org. And there'll be a number of different um, pictures that you can uh, pull in. And uh, if, and there's one on the uh, books and manuscripts and things of that nature. And uh, if they wish to um, contact us, our office phone number is 210-344-7707. They can also get information about our summer program, which will begin on the first Shabbat, the first Sabbath, the first Saturday of July, and they can stay for one week up to eight and a half weeks, depending how much free time they have. And what we can guarantee is specific intensive Jewish studies from a Messianic Jewish perspective by Messianic Jews, and they will learn a lot that most churches are simply not exposed to. They're not against it. They just haven't been exposed to it is the yeah. problem. That's awesome, brother. I appreciate your ministry. And I think the churches uh, do need, especially now than ever before, uh, because there are so many speculations and uh, so many false teach, so many false teachers are going around. And I think it's important. And then political climate doesn't help either uh, here and the Middle East. So there's so much going on. Uh, so we need to help uh, pastors and elders and churches to get equipped. Um, and expose them to this teaching. And part of that reason why we are talking about this or talking to you is to um, get the word out so people may have resources. Uh, we will also list all this information, all that what you just uh, um, shared with me under this episode in the description of this episode. Um, so as we close, um, this is pretty heavy uh, topic, all of it. Um, so I want to close with a joke to lighten the mood. So can you tell me a joke? I'll tell you what I call a rabbi story. Yes, I love and those that, stories. And every Jewish community have their own list of many rabbi stories. So this is just one of my favorite. But the background is that in Judaism, we were not taught to pray extemporaneously. All our prayers were through prayer books. So we had a Sabbath prayer book, we have a Passover book, we have a book followed the holy occasions like Yom Kippur, the Atonement, and Feast of Trumpets, and so on. The stories of a rabbi who's been praying through all of these prayer books since he was a young man, or even a teenager actually, and in his old age, he did not reckon, he did not understand why he doesn't know more about the God of Israel than when he was a child. He was retired from the rabbinate. So he closed his prayer book and decided he would pray with his own words, and then maybe he'll hear a voice from God. And if so, maybe he can ask God some questions to get to know him better. He closed his uh, prayer book and began for the first time praying with his own words. In the beginning, he stumbled a lot. He wasn't used to praying that way. As time went, but as time went on, he got smoother and more eloquent. And after praying for a very long time, suddenly he hears what we call a bat call, Hebrew for a voice from heaven. And the voice says, yes, Rabbi, what do you want from me? Rabbi says, I want to ask you just a few questions to get to know you better. And the voice says, okay, go ask. Well, my first question is, what does time mean to you? And God says, time to me is like this. One second is like a million years. A million years is like one second. Rabbi says, huh. Well, my second question is, what does money mean to you? Then God says about the same. One penny is like a million dollars, a million dollars like one penny. Rabbi says, I have a third question. May I please have one of your pennies? <laughs> and, God, 
And God says, of course, just wait one second. I love it. <laughs> now, I love, I'm so glad. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I knew that was going. Um, that's awesome for a second. Uh, thank you so much. Awesome, awesome, awesome discussion. Thank you so much for being on the show again. That was uh, Arnold Franklin Baum, and he's the founder of Aerial Ministries. Thank you to all our listeners. If you appreciate this podcast, please be sure to subscribe to the show. You've been listening to Our Urban Voices with Dr. Alphonse Javed, which presents Christian narratives through diverse voices that impact urban ministry. Please check back for new episodes every week.